Today's video is brought to you by Keeps the Hell Loss Treatment for Men. More on them in just a bit. The South China Sea and its surrounding waters have been the focus of territorial disputes for over a hundred years. Currently, China, Brunei, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines all allege that they have the right to claim all or part of the sea and the islands located therein. There are a few reasons why the area is so heavily contested. The biggest reason is the South China Sea's importance as a trade route. While it is often erroneously reported that $5.4 trillion worth of global trade passes through the sea each year, the actual figure is closer to $3.3 trillion. That is still a huge amount, accounting for roughly 15% of global trade annually and nearly 40% of all of China's trade. Controlling the South China Sea would not only provide economic leverage over the trade routes to whoever successfully led claim. It would also provide them with security. Sending trade vessels through an area that has half a dozen hostile nations claiming ownership, not to mention the pirates, is not necessarily the safest way to transport cargo. Having globally recognized dominion over those routes would improve the security of their ships, though there would still be pirates. Then there's the matter of crude oil and natural gas. The seabed is believed to contain billions of barrels of oil and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. Whoever controlled the region would have the rights to explore and exploit those resources. They would also have the rights to the fish, which is a non-negligible part of the equation as well. The fishing industry in the South China Sea officially employs 3.7 million people, and unofficially, it's even higher than that. One of the most contested areas in the sea is the Spratly Islands. It was an archipelago of nearly 20 small islands, totaling 448. That is, until in 2013, when China created seven artificial islands, totaling nearly 3,000 acres. The Spratly Islands have long been a disputed region, with the most recent dispute beginning nearly 70 years ago. In the 1930s, the islands were recognized as being acquired by France before Japan seized control of them. Following World War II, Japan signed the Treaty of San Francisco to establish peaceful relations with the Allied nations. One of the provisions of this 1951 treaty was that Japan would relinquish control of the Spratly Islands, but the treaty did not name any beneficiary who would gain control over the islands. This meant that, as far as the neighboring nations were concerned, the islands were no longer owned by anyone and were fair game for annexation. Most of the claims for annexing all or some of the islands are rooted in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. These claims are related to either the country's continental shelf or their 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone as defined by UNCLOS. While those claims are argued within the scope of the treaty, it results in overlapping areas that nations could claim to have rights to. However, China has a different rationale for claiming ownership of the islands that worked outside the scope of UNCLOS. China claims that Beijing had historic rights to the islands as they had been utilizing the area for fishing and taking refuge on the small island since around 200 BC. While arbitrators have made rulings on the matter, nothing has actually been agreed to. For decades, small-scale island building has been going on in the Spratly Islands to try and bolster the nation's claims to the area. These efforts were primarily performed by Taiwan and the Philippines. But China wasn't interested in building islands on a small scale. Their efforts began in 2013, and by 2016, the seven islands that they had constructed among the Spratly Islands not only totaled over six times the landmass of the original islands, but they accounted for more landmass than every artificial island created by all other nations throughout combined history. All right, so just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about Keeps. Look, if you've noticed your hairline is starting to recede, I definitely have. Or maybe you're just tired of constantly finding hair on your brush or pillow. If you're on a future like mine, you won't even have a brush anymore. Two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35. But don't worry, Keeps has got you covered. They're an online subscription service that helps you keep the hair that you have. Their clinically proven treatments combat the symptoms of hair loss and they're delivered straight to your door. The best part, treatment plans are personalized and recommended by licensed medical providers. They're also affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. And look, if you ever need help, Keeps has got you covered 20 24-7. They have a network of expert medical advisors, prescribers, and care specialists to support you in making your hair goals a reality. Plus, each treatment plan comes with a full year of unlimited messaging so that you can connect with your medical provider about anything 
any time. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has everything your hair needs delivered straight to your door. They even have an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. So if you want to stop hair loss, get expert care without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy, well, head over to keeps.com slash megaprojects or click the link in the description below to get your special offer. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash megaprojects. Hair loss stops with Keeps. And now back to today's video. The process of creating an artificial island is actually very simple, and it even dates back to ancient Egypt, though we tend to think of it as a more modern practice. The first step is to build the base for the islands. This is usually done by digging out a large flat area on the seafloor and then filling it in with gravel before piling rocks or bags of sand on top of it. From there, a coffer dam is built around the base. A coffer dam is a watertight enclosure built around the base of what will become the islands. It's usually made of metal or concrete, and the water is pumped out of it so that the islands can be built. This structure serves to prevent the materials being used to create the island from falling away into the sea. Rather than building a base through this method, China took a shortcut by building the islands on top of existing underwater structures, most notably coral reefs. Unrelated to the geopolitical implications of their island building, this decision has drawn a lot of criticism internationally for the damage that it's done to the reefs and the ecosystem of the South China Sea as a whole. But China had a lot of islands to build in a very short period of time, so they were naturally going to employ the fastest methods possible. So once the base is built, the next step is to fill it in with sand and dirt. When an artificial island is being built in a lake or off the coast of a continental mass, oftentimes sand will be transported from the mainland to the water in order to build the islands. However, this wasn't an option for China's endeavors in the Spratly Islands. Trying to transport sand from mainland China to the construction site would take just far too long. Instead, they decided to use ships called cutter suction dredges to dig up the seafloor for use on their new island. These ships would use large tubes to cut up material on the seafloor, grind it up into sand before sucking it through a tube onto the ship. It's then blown out into the coffer dam through a different pipe. China's largest of these cutter suction vessels, the Tianyu, can dredge the equivalent of three swimming pools every day. Hour. Unfortunately, because all of this soil came from the bottom of the sea, it was going to have a much higher water content than sand that would be imported to the site. A drainage pipe had to be inserted into the waterlogged soil so that the moisture could eventually seep out of the sand and escape through the pipe. This one step of the process should have taken about five months, roughly 25% of the total construction time. No other construction could take place during this process either. Removing the moisture from the ground and giving it proper time to compress and set due to gravity is extremely important for the stability of anything that they'd hoped to build on these islands. Once the ground was properly set, China could then begin paving roads and constructing buildings on its new islands. But they were interested in building much more than some Airbnbs for fishermen looking to take lodging in case of sudden severe weather. With ownership of the Spratly Islands and the entire South China Sea so heavily contested, China was trying to get a leg up on the competition. The newly constructed islands were clearly visible on satellite images, so China couldn't try and claim that they hadn't created them. However, in 2017, they did claim that they were not militarizing the islands. This rather dubious claim came over a year after photos of the three islands showed what appeared to be three fully armed and operational military bases. Of all the claimants to the South China Sea, China was the only one to not have an airfield in the Spratly Islands. This was seen as a huge tactical disadvantage and the primary reason why these artificial islands were created. China hasn't been terribly forthcoming about the capabilities of these military installations, so for the most part, we have to rely on photos of the islands. The three islands that have been militarized are Subi Reef, Mischief Reef, and Fiery Cross Reef. The main thing we know for sure is that all three are equipped with airstrips capable of accommodating heavy aircraft. China publicly tested these airstrips using commercial airliners before conducting tests with military jets. These airstrips are the only aspect of the bases that they have spoken about publicly, but the images taken of the bases show a lot more. All three islands appear to be equipped with anti-aircraft weapons and missile defense systems. Radomes, weatherproof structures to protect radar antennas, can be seen on the islands as well. Fuel depots are also visible, and at least one picture shows a plane refueling on the runway of one of the islands. When there aren't planes on the runways, 
trucks were often parked along it to prevent anyone from attempting to forcibly land on their islands. There also appeared to be barracks, medical facilities with helipads, port facilities for docking vessels, and at least one basketball court to keep those on the islands entertained. Despite all of the facilities on the islands and the speed at which they were constructed, none of the available images make them look like bustling hubs of activity. Many of the buildings have even been described as looking as though they've fallen into disrepair, despite having been built as recently as five years ago. That's not to say they are unmanned by any means. One photo on Mischief Reef showed two Type 22 catamaran missile boats. Those boats, which are armed with stealth capabilities and anti-ship missiles, proceeded to chase away Filipino news crews who were trying to monitor China's activities in the region. Similarly, the Chinese bases on these islands have issued stern warnings to United States naval vessels while they conducted free mode navigation operations in the region. The United States routinely conducts these operations around the world in areas that one nation has attempted to lay claim to, despite being categorized as international waters. No action has been taken against the United States while conducting these operations, just a series of warnings from the islands, though in the media the Chinese government has cited these incidents as provocations. Thus far, the bases installed in the South China Sea seem to be running on skeleton crews and have done little more than make idle threats and provide a refueling station for Chinese aircraft and naval vessels. This raises the obvious question of why China wanted to embark on the world's largest island-building project to create them in the first place. While being the only nation contesting the region without an airstrip in the Spratly Islands was seen as putting China at a disadvantage, in the event of actual conflict, the conventional wisdom is that these islands would be a liability. Their distance from mainland China would make them difficult to defend, and keeping them fully staffed and operational is a really costly endeavor. It's believed that these islands were built as part of China's military strategies that are referred to as cabbage wrapping or salami slicing. Cabbage wrapping is a tactic used by the Chinese military to gain control of islands by surrounding and overwhelming them with layers of different vessels ranging from naval ships to fishing boats. Having these island bases that both harbor naval vessels and provide a resupply point for other ships could aid them in employing cabbage wrapping tactics on the other islands in the region, encasing them in layers of Chinese ships that cut off all support from the outside world. It's a straightforward and effective tactic. Salami slicing, or nibbling like a silkworm as it's referred to in Chinese, is a much more nefarious tactic. It's based on making a large number of small provocations. When completed one at a time, then none of the actions would constitute or justify a declaration of war, but had it all been done simultaneously, it potentially could have. The end result is that China is able to slowly put itself into more advantageous position for the future without providing proper justification for military action against them. These artificial islands are an extension of the salami slicing tactics that China has already been performing in the South China Sea for decades. They would repeatedly take aggressive actions against the other nations that claimed rights to the region, but would immediately back off any time they were met with meaningful resistance. This is similar to how they launched ships to chase Filipino news crews away from their islands, knowing there would be no resistance. While they merely instructed the U.S.'s freedom of navigation operations to leave their property without actually trying to enforce the claims. Over the course of only two years, China was able to construct seven artificial islands in the South China Sea that account for more land area than all other artificial islands created since ancient Egypt. They then used three of these islands to build military installations in an attempt to further establish and defend their claims the entirety of the South China Sea. And realistically, they're not done yet. There isn't a lot of activity from these military bases yet, but it's only been a few years since they were first constructed. It's not out of the question that this period of relative dormancy from these bases is part of China's salami slicing tactic and that the capabilities and activity of these islands will be increased in the years to come. Only time will tell what China's true intentions for these newly constructed military bases are. But as the claimant nation with the least legitimate claim to the Spratly Islands under international law, it's probably safe to assume that these islands weren't being built defensively.